If you want to see what kind of reflection here we would have, imagine there is an eyeball right here, right? What that eyeball is seeing from that point. It's seeing this finger, but what's behind the finger for it? What What is it seeing over there behind the, the scene, you know? That's where it's looking. It's looking the opposite direction from what we're seeing. Hi guys, my name is Borodante, and welcome back to Overpaint. And also, happy 2022, everyone! I'm finally back. I feel quite rusty, as if I had a factory reset on me. But to start, you gotta start. So let's go. So this is Overpain, so I'll go through my Patreon page and check out all the submissions that you guys sent to me during December 2021. And I'll try to give you some advice and maybe fix something. First patient, Akuma. Hi, Akuma. Hey, Boro. I'm new to all this, and I didn't really have this much personal time this month, but I hope you're doing good. I am alright. So this is an older piece which I really like, but I feel like the skin tone is pretty off, the lighting isn't really natural, and I especially struggled with rendering the metal on her jaw and on her hands. Please, I need help with metal. So skin tone, lighting, and metals. Materials and lining. Now this looks like a job for me. So we'll get started with all this right after a quick word from this channel sponsor Wingfox and their new course called Advanced Environment and Keyframe Design Blender Plus Photoshop. Now this one is a mad course, so check this out. Your tutor is Hristo Dimitrov Chukov, which is a beast in concept art. He worked for everyone. I mean Marvel, Amazon Prime, Fox, Disney, Universal, as well as a bunch of games. He also plays a guitar right there. The man is unstoppable. And he's here to share with you guys his approach in developing the key shot with detailed environment and the character character and also action going on, so it's a complex shot that involves everything representative of a future project. And this right here is like a grown-up work. It's not just about how you paint, it's using any tools you may possibly need to get the best result consistently, no matter what kind of thing you need to visualize. But with all that said, of course, mainly this is a drawing painting course, so it's not just, you know, 3D and whatever. So if any of you guys are interested, right now the course is in the early birds fundraising stage, meaning it will start releasing in 12 days, but you can get the full access to the course when it starts coming out for only $39. The affiliate link to the course is in the video description. Now back to Overpaint. So I want to start with maybe slightly increasing the length of the, of the canvas here, making it like this, it's just because I feel like the eye level being actually perfectly in the middle, so the face is like at the bottom part, just felt like something I had to fix. And this way we also get a little bit of this uh, extra space underneath the hands that also do this whole lightning thing, which is, you know, it's nice to have a little bit of a framing with this negative space around, like underneath it, so it wouldn't be actually touching the bottom border of the camera like that. Now I'll apply a little bit of a gradient here so we would have a bit of a natural transition because right now it feels really blank. Something like that. I think it was kind of going on in there. Not sure about the geometry of this. This is an original character, right? You haven't really covered on that. Kind of reminds me of the character from Overwatch, but that was like a guy robot thing and this is a gal. Now, it's kind of hard for me to read what exactly is going on with the hands in here, actually, if I really try to think of it. Now, the bottom two fingers, I think this is what they are. But if this is what they are, everything else is very, very strange. Almost like if it's maybe like this, because I'm seeing like this is the fingers going underneath. It's just proportions are very off. The fingers are really small in there, but maybe because you were just literally squeezing that in to whatever the space you had. But yeah, I'm gonna assume that's what's going on. I'm not sure what this is then, like what is this dark line? I'm just trying to make sure I actually just fix things and not just change them completely, you know? So 
in terms of this gesture, obviously we need to go a lot like longer or something. Like it's really, I'm really hesitant because I'm not sure what's going on in, in with these wrinkles. They really don't feel like you actually meant that, but I can't come up with any other versions. So I'm just gonna go with that real quick. So we need to show the tension in here if we're going for, you know, a really open part in here. The skin is really tense if that's the case. And I'm also gonna go with a different shape of this, like, thumbless, fingerless glove. It should be, like, extending in here a little bit. And the thumb generally goes from, like, a wider stance in here, like, there's a, a certain angle. It doesn't just start like that. I don't know. Hard to explain. Look it up. <laughs> like, I would also need to look it up, but generally your question was not about anatomy, and good call on not asking my anatomy advice, because I'm not a guy for that. But I'm just generally trying to improve it a little bit, because it's really kind of distracting. Something like that. At least we have like an actual, almost, not really like a bigger index finger going on here. This is what we need at least. I don't know, something like that. Let's render the face with the metal jaw and maybe a little bit of the hands right there. Maybe the hair as well, let's see how it goes. But the skin, if we were going for a like realistic skin, I would add a little bit more transition, like you probably already kind of did it. No, you almost did not. So what happens is all your colors are like very much in the yellow spectrum. Although if I go way over there, there's some redness. But I feel like this color is a bit waxy. I would just push it closer to red. And that's, that's like a flashy color a little bit less waxy, while we keep the brighter colors closer to yellow as they are. So that transition, a bit more red in the dark, a bit more yellow in the brights, is a generally a good rule of thumb to start with a decent skin color. If the character is white, of course. Now the nose, let's literally get rid of all these dark lines, because, like, look even at my nose. There's no dark lines, like black lines, outlines, right? So it's obviously not the way to go. There needs to be something else. So what we do know is that uh, judging by the angle of light on your cheek right here, even originally, whenever what's facing up is brighter, facing down is darker. So I'm assuming the light source is kind of from the top, like just the main light source that's lighting up the face. So the nose will also be facing up, same as or even stronger than the cheek. So it's gonna be pretty bright. So like this, and then it curves the other way, right? So it straighten, straightens up. We switch to the forehead, so we don't have that facing up anymore, so it gets dark. Now, the same thing is going on on the edges on the nose, like on the sides of the nose. Uh, if this is face facing up, this is turning away, and this side also turning away. So those become darker. So I'll do the same thing. So instead of drawing any kind of outlines, I'm just turning planes around. And in there, we have like a bit of a shadow from the cloth and also the blue ambience from the lightning action. So I'll darken that up a bit. Now in here, I'll start this uh, like bottom eyelid a little bit thinner in here because at this part it kind of like only starts and then it widens to the outer side. That's usually how it goes. So generally I'm doing that. This is the kind of stuff that's perfect to find, you know, just the right photo reference for you. Like find some kind of model that looks the way you want your character to have certain features, you know. But generally, yeah, like I would go a little bit like that. Not as sharp, maybe, because that looks weird. Now, yeah, I'll generally apply this logic everywhere and uh, see how I can polish things up and adapt everything.
So yeah, I decided with hair to go like from scratch a little bit. So I filled up everything with the base color and added like a curvature. So as we curve away from that light source that's in the center, the hair just be becomes closer to this color as well as when we go like downwards. And yeah, then I added some brighter spots on top. I only have to repaint a lot of things because there's this big blue glow going on as well as it was an obstacle in here as well and with uh, with the metal in here as well. So it's all in one layer. So I have to like cover with the base color and then go from it because otherwise it's not going to work at all. That's why I like this part of the face. I think I kind of made it work, but it's definitely like easier to make it correct right away. See, so yeah, I would even go ahead and make this part a little bit shaded. It's all about the curvature, you know, the nose is facing forward, this cheek is facing forward, and this plane is sort of a little bit sideways. So we generally show that by darkening it. But of course, if the light source would be from this angle, this would be the brightest, this would be the darkest, it would be all the opposite. And yeah, generally, I think it kind of works that way. Obviously, in here, we had like a big problem with like not knowing how to define the geometry. That's why there was a lot of outlines and very flat colors on the skin. And in here, instead of the outlines, I went with change in brightness on the surface and we don't need the outlines anymore. It almost becomes an outline at certain areas where there's like strong curvature. So in here is almost a dark outline, but really it is just a sharp gradient a little bit in there. And all the round objects, they have that strong curvature and strong gradients, like everything that's round, it curves away really fast at the very edge. So if it's facing away from the light, it will be like somewhat light, somewhat slightly darker, slightly darker, and then suddenly curving away really fast. So in here is like a much stronger because of this curvature, like this last bit is darkening really fast. And it kind of like if you don't pay attention to the detail, it kind of looks like it's just an outline of an object. That's where outlines are coming from in general, because we're round. If we would be like all boxy, we probably wouldn't be painting things with uh, with outlines. That's my working theory. And yeah, that part of the eyelid is like the, the meat part. So it, it should show some redness, otherwise the face looks like it's not real, like it's just made of wax altogether. And if you show that some areas actually have, you know, meat parts, it looks a lot more believable right away, as well as the nose a little bit or something like that. Maybe the cheeks would be a bit more red. Anyhow, of course, we can always switch to a smaller brush with a bit of a brighter color of the highlight and just define some extra details that would actually catch the viewer's eye. And I'll add just a little bit of these details like this, maybe a few spiky shadows like that as well. And pretty much I don't have to do anything else. Generally, we defined the hair pretty nicely. Now let's do these robot arms, robot hands. So metal, the main thing about metal is that it's all reflections. I always say that, but what does it mean? It means that we need to really think about not what's lighting it from where, but what is being reflected where. Meaning uh, in here, if this would be not metal and uh, dark, I would just go, well, it's a gray object. The light source, as I stated with the nose and the cheek, is from the top. So I would just light it from the top. And as it curves away, I would darken it and darken it. That's how not metal would be lit. But with a metal, even if it's a matte metal, not shiny, it's actually still shiny. It's just rough meaning the, these reflections are very blurry in it. it. It just has like a complex surface, microscopically speaking. So all these reflections will be very, very blurred out, but there's still only reflections. There is no just normal lit surface and surface in the dark. But if there's a light source, it will give you a strong highlight that will be blurred all over the 
this area that can possibly see the light source so in there we will have this pretty much uh, like it's why it's so hard to understand the difference is because a lot of things overlap in a way like it still looks like the same way the object lit from the top the only difference is like it's a much stronger contrast and in here we have a finger really close so i would maybe introduce a little bit of the finger here but if it would be a lit object i would go with a very soft reflected light like this like you know just ray tracing kind of ambient light that's light reflected from the fingers but in this case this is metal so it's not lit by these fingers it's just reflecting these fingers so they will be sort of repeating the shape of these fingers a lot more they will still be kind of fuzzy because as i said the surface is rough but it's not going to be filling up the whole surface of this only a certain part of it that looks a lot closer like a mirror almost like just that finger and this finger showing up in there kind of like this maybe like darker but then it's just much blurrier like a blurry mirror and because of that that effect of blurry mirror it gives you almost the look of a lit normal object but it's just higher contrast it has deeper shadows because whenever it's reflecting something dark it's gonna be actually getting dark where you know a non-metal object wouldn't even bat an eye on that part like in here we're reflecting these really dark this really dark hair so i would make this part really dark but then later on maybe this shirt is reflected by that plane you know behind the hair already and it's all blurred out to an extent uh that blurriness it changes depending on how far away the object that's reflected so in here the hair is really close to the metal so the radius of this reflection is not that strong now i understand this is really overwhelming probably to just you know figure out what the hell i'm doing right now but this is just a good starting point to understand uh like what to look for at all maybe you will be looking out for more references and looking for reflections you know any metal no matter how non-reflected not shiny not chrome looking it is it's still only reflections it's just very very scratched and that's why all these reflections are all the way is just blurred out that's the takeaway from here this starts kind of looking metallic because i'm doing this thing that i'm actually working with reflections even though they're all blurry i'm doing gradients but that kind of starts making sense and in here i'll make it darker because probably behind the fingers like the good way to think about it probably i don't know i never said it this way but if you want to see what kind of reflection here we would have imagine there is an eyeball right here right what that eyeball is seeing from that point it's seeing this finger and this eyeball would be uh, seeing this finger you know but what's behind the finger for it what what is it seeing over there behind the the scene you know that's where it's looking it's looking the opposite direction from what we're seeing and in there probably there will be like this dark green background for instance so it makes a lot of sense to add sometimes the color of the background reflected on the metal even if it's facing forward because probably the same colors of the background are happening in front of the character not just behind them so this the surface this uh, lighting of the background is also going on behind us behind the camera so we're adding this color here and you know smoothing it together with this finger doing the same in there as well so that's kind of getting us that reflected look and here maybe some skin would be reflected but remember whenever you're reflecting anything it's always going to be darker than the actual object i'm not going to just grab this color and literally paint with it it's going to look like just more skin anything being reflected first like blend it together with a dark metal color and something like this will make a bit more sense now i'll also blend in a little bit of this bright highlight because this plane is still kind of facing upwards so it's gonna catch a little bit of that as well so that's the problem that's where complexity of rendering metals comes from when you render metals you render reflections and reflections are you know it's geometry it's holy grail of computer graphics so is that like black lipstick lipstick 
lipstick. I'm gonna add just a ever so slightly visible actual reflection from the bottom on them. So they're like, they're not super dry or anything. They're reflecting something, probably the fingers or whatever, or literally the immediate neighbor, uh, this metal shining. So maybe even this a little bit makes sense, but it's gonna look weird with this level of detail. So let's do the arms as much as I can. So I'm starting with like whatever's facing forward, like literally at us. That's what I'm filling up with this background color because I'm assuming forward is also a lot of green background in front of the character. All the glows go away, not because I don't like them, because it's impossible to paint over them. <laughs> so yeah, you see the main difference in thinking here is that I'm thinking where the mirror would would get us in a way, the mirror of the metallic surface. So I don't think where this, you know, plane of this hand is looking, I'm thinking about the ray that's coming from our eye will be reflected here and shooting all the way back there, reflecting the background, that specific background. So it's a different geometry going on now. And yeah, I'm gonna continue here as well. Like, I'm just getting this green. Pretty much it turns out to be just the base color for the whole thing, you know? In here, I'll switch a little bit to the reflection of the hair, probably, because there's like a lot of it, kind of, although that's actually not exactly a lot if you think about the angles. Now, there's this uh, bright lightning going on that I painted over, but it's still there, like this one, right? We can, and we should probably reflect it in here, but it's gonna be just this tiny detail like this, maybe even tinier. The only thing that's kinda gonna make it a bit bigger is because it's not chrome, it's slightly diffusing, everything is reflecting, but generally a very thin long line because this is a cylindrical shape, it makes all the reflections very thin and long. So yeah, the main thing, like the hardest thing to explain about metal is like the reflections. It's about the angles, how exactly to think about it. But it's pretty much always like shoot a ray right from your eyes, from where we are. Imagine you're shooting it with like a gun, like a water gun or I don't know, a projectile of sorts, like a paintball. And when it hits it, where will it like bounce off? You know, if you hit at the very edge, it will bounce off way over there, right? And hit the wall somewhere over there in the background. So that's what it will be reflected at the spot. If you hit this arm exactly in the center, it will bounce back at us. So kind of we are reflected, you know? So a lot of the times reflections are actually pretty dark in the very center because we assume the viewer, the camera is being reflected, something like that. Something that's obstructing the lighting of the environment because someone is standing in front of this character to be able to see them. That's a part of realistic things that you gotta think about, like they can't float in space because who's seeing them at all? And generally, whenever you paint reflections, when you start thinking about them, you legit have to think about what's going on around the character overall in the background. Because right now, I added this black line. Why? Because I thought of there should be not just a flat color, like you also have some kind of bright spots in the background, then they go into the darker area. So there's transitions. If you don't have transitions, you will have absolutely flat reflections that are not realistic and not pretty looking. So you need to introduce certain gradients and details. Gradients are the best thing to have in reflections. That's whenever you see any kind of advertisement of a car or something, they always have them either in ideal, some kind of studio lighting with nice controlled reflections, or it would be a shot at a sunset where, where we have like a nice gradient of the sky reflected on the surface of the car. That's because they know that that kind of stuff is what gives pretty looking reflections. So it's a good idea to think about just certain gradients that are being reflected and just follow the same rule for all the parts of your metallic object. 
and it will just eventually start looking like something that actually makes sense. Like, don't give up if this is all like super weird and like too much. It's, it's not an easy subject, it's true. I tried many times to explain it as easy as I can. There's just no easy way about it. You kinda need to ray trace in your head and think about what's going on outside of your actual picture of what actually is seen in the shot to, uh, you know, to reflect that. Reflections, they let the eye see beyond what's within the canvas. So in here, I'm thinking about like the curvature somewhere at a certain point, we're starting to face that light source. Somewhere in there, there's that light source and it's going to give us like a nice highlight, like this highlight on the eyeball, but the eyeball is super glossy. It's wet, it has a very smooth surface. So that's why that reflection of a highlight of that light source is super sharp. In here, we're getting very fuzzy reflection, but it's still a highlight like that. So whenever with our paintball, we hit this spot, it will bounce off into the light bulb at the top and probably break it. Uh, but yeah, I guess that'll be it. Uh, this is like a very complex subject. I could spend another couple of hours, you know, detailing this thing because it really, uh, reflections are something that really shines in, in the detail. You need to make sure you follow everything. Like if you look from very big distance, it kind of starts looking like this is sort of reflecting. It has this contrast and general feeling of uh, it being reflective of something. But if we go closer, it kind of falls apart because it's just big brush strokes and there's a lot of glowing old underpainting going on in there. And also, yeah, of course, you can come up with more stuff. As I said, you need to come up with more background than just what you can see. So maybe actual like rim lighting or something just bright being behind the character at the top, like higher over there, there's maybe a bit of a sky or something like that. That's gonna give us this nice, you know, contour shine like this as well. And you see, we get a lot of lines. So in here, we're reflecting something black, like really dark, dark green or something. Then it's just green. Then we kind of catching a little bit of the highlight from the main light bulb over there. Then again, green. And then this contour reflection from way in the back. So we have a lot of lines, very high contrast changes on the surface. That's the big difference of the metallic look comparing to non-metallic. And yeah, some really bright shines in here since it's close to this uh, magical, probably also lightning kind of thing going on. These fingers are gonna shine, you know, you just keep solving it and then breaking into smaller details like how exactly this metal right here is curving around. So will it also start facing that light source? So you add a highlight there, you know, how this thing will work depends on what kind of design you imply. So it all goes into details and you can never let go of it. You always have to like whatever details you add, they have new angles, new background to look for where the that ray will bounce off and all that. Second patient is Fenrex, formerly Artistic Apricot. Hi Fenrex and welcome back Artistic Apricot. Hi Borodante, I'm sorry about this coming so late in the month. Don't worry about that. I have two concerns. One is how to incorporate a background into a composition without making it too complex because it is easily overwhelming to jump into. Second, I was wondering how to be more efficient with building up a painting. If you look at the painting, I waste a lot of time making details I later paint over because the pose was off or lighting wasn't right. Really good questions. F fan racks? Man, it's gonna be hard to memorize that. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, this is the final version, right? There was a lot of stuff going on in here, 
but then you changed it and all that detail from the outfit disappeared. Well, I mean, anecdotally, the best way to avoid that is to make a detailed sketch to really decide on everything so everything really works. And after that, you start rendering. That is, if you find it hard to repaint things and everything. And about the background, it's a very interesting thing. Remember, guys, we had a submission a couple of months ago where there was a character sitting in a car with like unusual hair that was like very geometrical. And after a while, I figured out they were sitting in a car and I talked about this exact issue as it is here. So when you start thinking about, okay, I have the character sitting in a 3D world. How do I, you know, build the 3D world for them? So it would look three dimensional and everything. Well, we start with this line. It's always this line. It was the same line back then. Uh, this line is like we're three dimensional and this is the perspective, right? This is how it's going on. But you have to remember that when you're painting a character, it's always like a portrait. And a portrait has one, one of many rules. And that rule is, this is the horizon line. And if the horizon line is here, then this plane should probably have a vanishing point over there. So this direction is never gonna be so vertical. When it's so vertical, it means the horizon line is just somewhere ridiculously up high, which means we're literally looking downwards like this on the character. Like we're looking, all of this is a whole lot of floor and floor and floor and floor. There is no sky part. We're looking downwards like this is a security camera. So this is the main issue and this is the biggest problem. I remember I had the same issue myself earlier. And when I realized, like, why, why is this like, it's just, it feels so, like, life feels so horrible when you try to add this background and it's just, it looks bad, but why? This is a three-dimensional thing, I'm not doing anything wrong. But you do, because you forget about, like, real angles. This is a person, we're standing and looking at them at their height level, preferably. It's like um, a rule of cinematography as well. Even if they're sitting down, the camera also needs to sit down. Eye level. You guys are at my eye level right now as well. And here too. <laughs> because that's an important thing. Cameras shouldn't just randomly be higher or lower than the character. So I would go with making it a lot more horizontal. It's fine, it's still three-dimensional, it still goes downwards, but just with this little fix, it's already a lot more just pleasant to look at. I didn't even introduce any new details, I didn't really change the geometry, you know, but because we have this angle closer to horizontal, we kind of understand that somewhere in here, we may be seeing the still horizontal static situation that lets us breathe a little bit. That's what we understand when we look at three-dimensional world, that like these angles, they give us hints on what's going on. So at least a little bit like that. Not to mention that the best way to do it is to just look up references of people sitting down somewhere. So you would have better ideas than just this concrete wall that the character is casually leaning on. It really lacks certain visual library or, you know, furniture library or something like that. Like, wherever they are, you know, something gotta actually be here. But yeah, generally about, you know, building the character, finding their pose and figuring it out before adding a lot of details. That's something I've been talking about a long time ago in a video like uh, how to paint like a god. Describing the idea of painting without outlines. And that's pretty much like painting without actual details. You sort of just define planes. So you plane things up. Like this is uh, darker in here, and this is facing upwards is brighter. And with just these planes, making sure you don't dedicate, like don't allow yourself to make the brush too small, you know? It needs to keep being big. And with this approach, 
you will never lose any details because you don't have any. You're just looking almost on the level of abstraction. But that's a skill that you need to work on a lot. Make sure you look at the How to Paint Like a God video. Then I made a second version of it, but it's a bit of a different subject in there. But I think it's also quite useful. Yeah, like this thing right here, I would also first think about on more of a global lighting as well. You know, it's not just about designing things and not getting into details, but also thinking through bigger scale lighting before you move on to smaller scale lighting. So if you go with just bigger brush strokes, you will have to think about the fact that maybe the rim lighting will be a lot stronger at this upper plane. <laughs> since it's kind of from here and the shoulder is casting a shadow so in here we won't get that much of anything from the pink stuff and like later i'm adding details when i figure it out and yeah after that after you figure out stuff you can already add all those details and all that you see it's getting very different lighting because of that because the planes were defined first it's a very unusual thing, like the whole character was painted with actively nothing going on underneath their bum. Like they're not sitting, they're kind of floating like, and wait a second, this is not a piece of their outfit, this is a chair. Oh, yeah, there's probably something missing in its shape a little bit. Maybe it should be a bit more straight, because I thought it was another bit like this. Is this feather or cloth? I'm I, probably cloth. I thought this was also that, but it is not. It needs to have a bit more symmetrical and, uh, you know, hard details. So I wouldn't confuse it with just flapping outfit details. There you go, now they're actually sitting, now I get it. Because I really thought like I needed to invent some kind of chair, but it's already there. Yeah, darker contact shadows can always go with uh, darker stuff when there's other objects nearby, like really covering up from any light source. Yeah, you see these little dark shadows right here, they really add certain presence. This is a sketch and this is like something that's really there. And here is gonna happen as well. So we would really bring the message across that there's contact going on. They're actually leaning against this wall. And of course, we never leave any surface absolutely flat. So this plane was absolutely flat. I'm adding like a gradient. Usually it's a good idea. If it's like a strong angle and there's a, well, this is the Fresnel reflection situation. This is borrowed CG, we we can't not mention Fresnel reflections. So yeah, with, uh, with reflections like that at a strong angle, it's always a good idea to like, whenever it's getting closer to us, it's getting a bit darker. As it's further away, closer to the horizon, it's getting a bit brighter. And this way, it's uh, like full color, actual plane. You had it all over the place. Actually, this strong change in color is kind of odd because it makes it look like it's uh, it's supposed to be, like even if you sort of smooth it out like this, uh, it's supposed to be like a round shape then. It's not a plane. It's kind of like this because why would the lighting suddenly change colors so rapidly? And of course, if it's not smooth like this, that means it's, it has this kind of shape <laughs> like everywhere. And in our case, like very subtle gradient and it's not not like this, but just like this, you know, it's not following the direction of the plane it's just following the horizon sort of. Now a quick dude, I don't know. It's all about the design, you know, you have to have a certain design in mind, but it always helps to define any kind of design when you can really think with those angles and values. So I'm choosing like darker color of this pink and that defines a stronger angle away from the light source and all that. I know what that is, but I know one thing, like there shouldn't be any like dark color after the pink rim light. Pink rim light is the final, final line, final color. And yeah, I'm gonna use very vertical brushwork on this wall right here 
to translate the actual plane. If uh, the brushwork is all over the place, it's kind of hard to read what exactly is going on. And this way, it means it's like it's turned away from us. So all the lines are like this, sort of. It, it, it's having its own horizon here. So that's why all the lines are like this, because they're going away in this direction. If there would be something round on it, it would be like this for the same reason, you know, all the lines are being squished like this, all the details are the little bumps. That's why the brushwork needs to follow this direction as well, to imitate a whole bunch of random details, random textures that are distorted in the same direction. And a final note on, you know, effortlessly adding a background is, uh, well, adding something in aerial perspective. Whenever you go with, uh, you know, you need to introduce some kind of dense environment. It looks like a club or a bar, right? Uh, this is kind of like that kind of chair, I guess. Uh, the point is there was like dense air. Either a lot of people breathing or, you know, smoking, whatever, if it's retro style thing. So you just introduce certain details that show through that dense aerial perspective. This uh, foggy, smoky air really adds atmosphere, kind of literally, to the scene. And you can find anything you want in those, you know, in these silhouettes or whatever. Maybe somewhere, like we have this colder light going on, maybe uh, it will light up some fog in that part a little bit. Just don't be afraid to blend colors together and pick up that new color with an eyedropper and actually paint with it. That's how you get this painterly look that I'm taking an immense advantage of all the time. That's why my brushwork looks like this, because I literally, I overlay a color, then I grab it and paint with it instead of, you know, semi-transparently overlaying anything. But yeah, I gotta say, usually whenever they start, if you really want to work in color in one layer, you gotta start with this kind of aerial perspective-ish abstraction before you start blocking in the character. That's the best way. Even if you'll want to change something later, you know, you'll already have really close colors to start with, to go from. And like this, I like if I would want to, you know, add more, I would really have to work around those edges and you really don't want to touch those, right? Because that's that's work. So generally, if you were thinking like the character will be sitting down, then maybe you should have started with, you know, generally blocking in like darker gradient in here like this and then start painting the character on top of it sitting here and it would be a much easier thing just because you had proper contact colors going on of the background immediately around the character. Of course, some pink stuff could be going on in here as well, but a little bit of that edge work is inevitable here. A little bit like more horizontal lines of the shadows on the floor will really sell the idea that this is a floor, even though there is no extra detail going on in there. You know, this is the shadow from this, uh, from this and this casting on the floor. The same idea as here. This is this angle. So all the details, like all the brushwork should be like that. And this is a floor, so we need to imitate details like this by using only horizontal lines. Let's maybe add a tiny hint of that bar table top thing. Keep on going on back there as well. Fading away into the thick vaping fog. There you go. You see, it kind of continues. It's much nicer now. It actually makes sense a little bit and it wasn't a lot of work. If anything, you can like add a little bit of dark in here as well. So it would really feel like, okay, that's the wall for sure. Or the bar, bar place. <laughs> yeah, like that. See, now they're actually sitting at this thing and it keeps going real nice. Next and final patient is George Fritsch. Hi, George Fritsch. Hi, Boro. I hope you had a good Christmas and will get good into 2022. So far, so good. Thank you. Hey, I decided to send you this one. The intention was to try out some brushes and create a forest. However, after two hours of playing Death Stranding, interesting, <laughs> I could not help but create this. 
It has not much to do with Death Stranding, though. I think I like the idea of the whimsical baby. Oh, so this is where it came from, the baby in the forest. I believe that there is so much to improve that it is difficult to ask a qualified question. So what can you do? What comes to your mind? How could this become better and more whimsical? George. Well, this is a quite a big question, because one way I would actually approach it, if it wouldn't be my work right now to, you know, improve it, I would just keep it as it is and admire it as a piece of modern art, <laughs> because this is what it is, literally. But if we we're going for some kind of, you know, traditional value beautified painting, which is a lot less valuable than what you created here, I would go with, um, first of all, moving the baby a bit away from the canvas. Let's, uh, from the edge of the canvas. Let's start with that, because that ain't good. You generally have, like, a very, like, 101 problem with uh, anything in three dimensions, apparently, because the baby being on the floor literally needs to touch the bottom of the canvas because it's at the bottom. That's kind of logic, you know? And generally, it looks like a platformer, like a backwards Mario game or something like that. Everything is two-dimensional platformer game. Now, I'm not gonna fix that because this is overpaint, not repaint. So we're gonna have to make sense out of uh, this two-dimensional composition. Like, generally, you have planes and everything. I guess the only real problem with uh, two-dimensionness of this picture is the baby being perfectly facing sideways. I guess that gives that strong vibe. But you know what? Why is baby forbidden from looking exactly sideways? That's not forbidden. Let's just make it actually appear like it's really in three dimensions here. So I'll start with defining it, its contact with the three-dimensional world. So, uh, a shadow, right? This is where the baby is. Baby. Loop. <laughs> I don't know about the lines and everything. I'm gonna just take advantage of uh, these colors and blend them into whatever I want them to be. So I'll be defining just what I said in the previous submission about, you know, brushwork. If you want to define the ground, you need to work with the uh, horizontal brushwork. Like all the details you add, they need to be horizontal brushstrokes like this. This way you're selling the idea of this, of the plane that is at this angle. Now I'm gonna work on the lighting a little bit. I'll add like this bright color and just uh, add brighter lighting slash reflection on the back of the BB. Just to accommodate this lighting actually affecting the appearance to fit the baby into the environment. Actually light it up according to what's going on around. Now, I don't know how many wrinkles there's supposed to be on the back, because in here it's pretty intense. Uh, there may be some going on here as well. I, I don't know, like a little bit. Seems like there may be one in here. So that'll affect the reflection a little bit. With the hair, I'll do the same. So I'm making it brighter, a bit more pale, because reflections will usually desaturate. So that's just a basic thing to do. When when you go with the light like this reflection of something in the back. I'm not sure what's going on here. I feel like the hat is from a little bit of a different pose, maybe. Baby. But I feel like this is a bit more reasonable. And this probably wouldn't be as squished. Maybe. Baby. Okay, now I actually see this baby just crawling in three dimensions, even though it's facing sideways. So I think I kind of cured a little bit of the whole problem. Um, I would introduce some of the bushes that actually start inside of the canvas, not just from the bottom of the canvas like that, to, you know, like connect the world inside of the composition with its edges. So here's a bush, baby. You know, I spent over a hundred hours in Death Stranding, and I gotta say, I think it totally fits with the universe. Like, this is the BB's shore, the life and death border of each person. I think it was called the shore. It's about the person, so maybe BB 
maybe would have this as a shore. No, wait, it's not called shore, it's called the beach. That's right, <laughs> the beach. That's a better name. So yeah, uh, a little bit like you use a lot of silhouettes, probably uh, I see it's sort of a traced photos or like selection and cutout kind of situation. I'm just adding a little bit of a shadow and light play on them. So they would turn into almost real objects. Not too much though. <laughs> But again, you know, like look at stuff that's facing upwards to light it up from the top. Easy to make a mistake, but you can try. Something overlapping always helps to sell the actual three dimensionness of things, you know? So some of the bushes would be covering the baby for us. Oh yeah, actually, you literally had the overlapping right here, right? <laughs> it's just that it wasn't really painted, it was placed. And in here, I have an object positioned on the 3D plane in front of them. I guess it's just a little bit more based in that regard. But generally, yeah, you definitely used literal overlapping in the same fashion. I literally decided to double check, was it really like that? Because uh, when I looked at it in here, it really didn't feel like there was something wrong with the way the baby was really close to the edge. So I felt like maybe I pasted it wrong or something. But no, it's really like that. I guess uh, in a darker environment, the picture works differently. But yeah, I guess this is it. I don't know, I don't have a lot more ideas in terms of what to improve here. It's really amazing as it is. I'm not sarcastic, by the way. This is a multimedia kind of thing. It's it's not just, it's not a painting. It's a different thing. But I generally, I think what I did with uh, at least moving the composition higher and introducing at least a plane, maybe that's something that's actually working in favor of the initial art style and concept. But yeah, I guess that'll be it. Thank you guys, uh, Akuma, Fenrex, formerly Artistic Apricot, and George Fritsch. Thank you guys for your submissions. It was a lot of fun working on your stuff. Everything's very different. Always surprises me how I always get to work with a big variety of different things, solving different problems and, you know, different solutions and everything. If any of you guys want me to overpaint your picture like this, the link to my Patreon page is in the end of this video. You become my patron in the overpaint here. You post a picture with a message. I read the message and overpaint the picture. But for now, this is it. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Okay, all right. Yeah, it, it does improve things. I, I still got it, I think. <laughs> Although I felt super rusty.